Lord, we thank you for the blessing of Yeshua, your son, in our lives. We thank you for the certain hope that he has made for us. We pray and ask, Lord, that as we come to the end of our, our teaching series for the year tonight, Lord, that you would bring back to our minds, even over the break, Lord, that you would bring back to our minds everything that you need us to know for the days ahead, that you would anoint us with wisdom and with truth, that you would keep us fast on the solid rock, the foundation of your word, that you would maintain us in your Son by your Holy Spirit, and that you would restore to us, Lord, the joy of our salvation, the joy of the Lord, that we might be strengthened and able to stand on the days ahead. We pray for thee, Lord, who who uh, made the mistake of mowing the lawns in the dust today and now she's in bed with hay fever. We pray and ask, Lord, that you give her relief that you would speak to her and counsel her where she is. We pray for Mel and Steve and the family, Lord, and who are still really upset, or, you know, worried, Lord, with their daughter away from home the first time. Hard for them, Lord. Watch over that girl. Shepherd her, guide her, Lord, and place her where you know she'll be safe, put her amongst Christian family and find work for her, Lord, where she'll be safe, where she can grow in her faith and where she can be able, Lord, to know that you yourself are her father and your shepherd. For us, Lord, now, as we turn to your word, we ask you to open our hearts and our eyes and our ears, and Lord, and to inscribe on us your word, to depart the veil for us so we can understand and to keep us, Lord, constantly with a view of you going ahead of us, so, Lord, we're not walking left and right. We're not each one going his own way, but we'd all go together after you, follow wherever you lead, Lord Jesus. But how can we lead you, Lord, unless we know where you're going? So, Lord, please open our eyes, open our hearts, our spirits, our minds, so we can all be in, of one mind with you, one purpose with you, one direction with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so welcome to the last sermon for 2018. So the good news next week, in case you didn't know, is the young ones are going to host. I decided. So you don't have to prepare anything, because next week I just want it to be uh, praise and thanksgiving. So Holly, can we have like extra songs not all at once at the beginning but you know let's sing more next week because yeah. we won't have a sermon and it's a time for um, if you've got something to share you know a scripture that's like really been chasing you around for a bit share it or just something God's telling you share it you know testimony just something you want to give thanks to God and the you know with someone who can say amen so yeah so tonight then i'm only saying that and so can you guys just host that as opposed to leading it it's not quite the same thing isn't it and then everybody if you don't want to speak that's fine but if if you can think during the week if there's something you could share for like two three minutes or something something to contribute then um and what do you think of the idea of making it like potluck food wise so you make it a bit of a party? Well, you know, a bit of a... We could see what's available at the ice cream factory. In case there was ube available. What do you think? Yeah, so so we'll make it a bit of a, a potluck. And we'll, so it'll be less formal, you know, well, not that we're very formal anyway, but you know, so more of a, like an end of year thing, just a bit of sharing and praying, singing, eating. How's that sound? And yeah, everyone. So, so <laughs> yeah, well, see, normally, it's, see, normally I, I, me and Verona are hosting and we bring the food. So when you're hosting, so when you're hosting, yeah, yeah, we'll still bring stuff, but it's like, <laughs> and I might run a little bet as to like whether Miggy or Raniel brings the tastiest thing. <laughs> my money's on. How much? My money's on. My money's on faith, actually. So. 
the, the bail bail Maggie out. So, <laughs> but maybe Pat will bail Raniel out now that. Now he got this. <laughs> he's got it. He got it. He's got it. Yeah. Yeah. KFC's got it. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> if it's got secret herbs and spices, there'll you be questions. <laughs> you might be you might be run off your feet for your anyway. So anyway, tonight then is our last really like teaching teaching thing. And as I said last week, uh, we're actually on the actual calendar. We are right in the middle. We're at the uh, what's the date today? Eight. 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 So we're. So from the 3rd until the 10th, so what's that? We're about two-thirds of the way through Hanukkah, which is, if, you, uh, if we were being really strictly Christian, we would celebrate Hanukkah rather than Christmas. Why wouldn't we celebrate Christmas? Well, there's no commandment to celebrate his birthday at all. It's, you know, is it wrong to celebrate Christmas? No. You know? But it's, it's utterly made up. It's not actually. In fact, Christians didn't celebrate Christmas till about the 8th or 9th century. So it's not very old even as a... And then now, of course, has anyone heard Jesus mentioned even once in relation to Christmas on the radio or anything? No. It's just the fat guy in the red suit, isn't it? Who's he? Do you know for real? St. Nicholas. So he is a real person, but he's a Norwegian Catholic priest who lived in a little village with a lot of poor people. So just in his parish, he became famous for being able to lean in that way that priests can. He leant on his wealthy parishioners for money to buy toys, which he would hand deliver to the kids of the poor people in the parish. And because he was quite well fed, as priests tended to be in those days, um, that's where the Santa being the big jolly guy and that's where the sleigh and the reindeer come from because it's Norway and at Christmas it's snowing you know so he would literally turn up outside in the sleigh knock on the door and bring gifts for <coughs> the kids of the poor Saint Nicholas okay where's the red suit come from how old's that Coca-Cola, 1930 something. Yep, their most famous and most successful ever marketing campaign. They put St. Nicholas in a Coca-Cola red and white suit. So red and white Santa only goes back to 1930 and he's American and he's selling Coke. <laughs> you know, so you know, it's all a bit tacky, eh? Anyway. But if you like Christmas and if you, keep, if you can keep it Christian and family, don't ever think that I'm going to knock that because there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Just don't buy into the whole Christmas trees, where they come from. <laughs> they are, you know the Snoopy song, the Snoopy Christmas song? What language does it start in? You know the Red Baron, Snoopy and the Red Baron? You know that song? German. Mm. How's it go? Oh, Tannenbaum. Tannenbaum is German for Christmas tree, right? But burning a Yule log at December comes from the ancient Germanic pagan religions. Decorating a tree before you burn it, it's pagan. You know, so it's the same everywhere. So though get yourself too distressed about it. If you want a Christmas tree, fine, no problem. Just remember though that it's not, you know, it is what it is. Anyway, if we wanted to be really biblical though, the thing we'd do at this time of year is we would celebrate Hanukkah. So let's have a quick look and see what that's about as our last topic for the year. And the good thing is, there's one thing you're not allowed to do on during Hanukkah. Hanukkah's eight days long. And the thing you're not allowed to do on Hanukkah is you're not allowed to be sad. 
You're not allowed to fast. You're not allowed to do anything like that. It is supposed to be party time. Okay? So that's why it's a good thing to end on. And it is the... Actually, remember we said the other day that we're supposed to be sharing the good news of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom. So Hanukkah actually teaches us what the gospel of the kingdom means. So although, you know, most, a lot of our topics I have of necessity been quite scary or a bit heavy, Hanukkah is the opposite. So let's have a look, see. So who'd like to read Luke 21 for me? It's not very long. From verse 29 to 36. Would you like to read it while you're deciding who should, Holly? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> he told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourselves and know, this, know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my worlds will never pass away. Be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with Oh, caressing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life, and that they will close on you, on you suddenly like a trap. For it will come on all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch, and that you may... So it says in the scripture that God never does anything except that he first announces it through his prophets. Right? This is very similar. You have to understand that God will never do anything without telling his people first. The world won't get it, the false church won't get it, but the disciples will hear and they will not be taken by surprise. So it's the first thing to understand is that he, uh, he warns us in time. So you all know, you should all know Luke 21 and the Matthew version Jesus tells his disciples, these things are going to happen, and when you see them happening, get ready, because I'm coming. Okay? They will happen, so just watch for them. And he's talking about, um, you know, he talks about a, a tree. If you're a farmer, we could ask Jerry what season it was. If first thing he'd do is look at the trees, right? What state is the crop in? We'll tell you what's happening next. Any farmer can do that, right? So that's what Jesus is saying here. We need to understand what the signs of the times will be so that you're not taken, you're not caught unprepared. Then he ends that you must be prepared because it will happen suddenly. For everyone else, it'll be like there was no warning. They'll be looking at each other going, what happened? Like the flood, remember? When it actually was flooding, they couldn't comprehend that it was actually that what Noah said was actually happening. But Noah and his family were safely in the boat. Remember? And it's like that. Let's with keeping that in mind, let's scoot down to Romans fifteen there in the next box. Who'd like to read that for me? Mary Lou, do you want to have a go at that one? Romans fifteen. Uh, we who are strong ought to bear with with the failing of the weak and not to please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the insult of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that <coughs> through the endurance taught in the, scripture, in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had. That with one mind and one voice you may glorify the God and Father of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I included a bit of extra there just to remind you, we are supposed to be Christ-like. You know, so... So don't worry when you experience trouble or insult or whatever. It's not really aimed at you. Don't take it personally. It's what's in them not liking what's in you. Okay. 
But the most important thing it says in there is that these things, these old things, what happened to the Jews, are, were written down for our instruction. And the way I'd put it to a modern audience like yourselves is, God runs rehearsals, you know? So he rehearses what's going to happen with the Jews so that the whole world will understand from the past what's going to happen in the future. Does that make sense? And how often does God run a rehearsal? Well, sometimes it's over and over and over, where it's a different story and yet it's the same story. You know, different actors, but it's the same plot until you realize that, okay, so when man behaved like this, God behaved like that. Because when his people behaved like that, he did this. Because he doesn't change, because we don't really change. So what's part of, remember this is really at the core of Midrash, why we understand the scripture like we do. We, God gave us the Old Testament to teach us about the future. Everything he did points to what's going to happen. So he warns us in time, he runs rehearsals so that we can be quite accurately wise about what's going to happen. Why, what is the purpose? Well, it's simple. So that for those who are willing to listen, for those who are willing to be his disciple, when those things that have to happen, happen, you will not be caught off guard. You won't be left baffled by what's happening. I can see pizza. Anyone want pizza? Feel free to attack. <laughs> Does anyone want to grab pizza? I'll just pause a sec if you do. Just in case anyone wants pizza. I know it's highly unlikely. Me? No, I'm fine. I thought you were like me, McGee. You can resist anything except temptation. <laughs> so the next thing, this is, this is, Especially so of the end. By the end, I mean, you know, the end of days, the last days of mankind. So those really important topics where you don't want to get it wrong. You don't want to be found on the wrong team at the end, do you? Given what's going to happen. So this him warning us and rehearsing things, that's generally true, but it's especially true about these end time things, because if there's anything you need to get right, it's that. Can anyone take a guess why something about what happens in the end times would tell you that you need to be especially wised up to survive? What is, a, what is the core characteristic of the end times? That lawlessness and something really related that goes with that. Something to do with Satan's character. Deception. Ah, deception. That's it. Because the whole overriding theme of the end times is <coughs> deception. And there's only one cure for deception, and that is to be sealed in the truth. You know? If you don't have the truth, remember the thing Wayne always used to say, and Jacob says the same, how the US Treasury Department train treasury agents to detect counterfeit money. How do they do it? Yeah, so they make them sit with a real banknote and learn it because there's all these microscopic things that have to be on a real banknote. 
ours are the same. If you look, if you got, if you're bored one day, hold it up to the light and see what shines through. The more, the watermarks and all the rest. And there's also lots of microscopic stuff. Recently, out of an Austrian lake, they bought up uh, five million pounds worth of English banknotes that have been at the bottom of the lake since World War II, right? And people were like, ooh, it's a fortune. And in those days, banknotes were printed on linen, English banknotes, so the, not like paper. So it didn't mind being underwater, and it's so deep and so cold, didn't rot, right? And straight away, a couple of old Jewish concentration camp survivors put their hand up and said, may we examine one? And they held it, they were allowed to, and they held it up to the light, and they said, throw them all away. And they're like, why? He says, because we made these in the concentration camp. Because they were the best, the two best forgers in Europe, which is why the Gestapo arrested them, put them in a concentration camp, and made them manufacture counterfeit banknotes that they were going to use when they invaded England to flood the, you know, how did they know they were forged? Because they didn't want to help the Nazis, so as each one came off the printing press, when the guards weren't looking, as a guy was like examining it for printing faults, he had a hat pin, just a dressmaker's pin, and he poked the eyeball of the, the king, the King George back then. He put a hole through King George's eye with the pin on every single one. You know, knowing that he'd be able to tell the authorities if he ever got out that, you know, look, we made these millions of pounds worth of counterfeit notes, and but all we have to do is hold it up, and if the light shines through his eyeball, it's one of our fakes. Okay? So it's all those, it's the detail. We always say the devil's in the detail. Well, the answer to the devil's in the detail. It's knowing the truth, being able to, like a treasury agent, to know what the real thing really looks like. So it doesn't matter what kind of fake it is, if it doesn't match up to the real thing, you know it's a dud. No matter how many variations of dud, because goodness, there's a new deception out coming out every five minutes. If you tried to keep up, you'd be so exhausted. Don't even bother. Just learn the truth and then you'll be safe. So there's something in particular that uh, happens at the end and it's a, a certain person turns up on the scene. Who's that in the last days? Obviously Jesus in the end, but who turns up first? Who turns up first? Antichrist, right? So we need to know about this character. And you'll be pleased to know that not only has God warned us through the prophets all the way in the Old Testament, we're told all about him. And surprise, surprise, God has run a number of rehearsals. And tonight for Hanukkah, we're going to look at the most important of the rehearsals that tells you more about Antichrist and how to spot him and how to not be deceived by him, probably than anything else, right? And it's directly connected to Hanukkah. Unsurprisingly, because where does Hanukkah come in the calendar? At the end. So, the two most recent real dress rehearsals, the most recent one was in AD 70. Can I rub this off? AD 70 and AD 136. Because if you remember when we looked at Daniel 9 the other day, <coughs> there has to be an abomination that causes desolation set up in the temple, things like that. I don't know if you remember that or not. That happened in AD 70. The Roman military commander that invaded the thing, he had a temple, oh, sorry, he sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple. And he had a, uh, a statue of Jupiter set up in the holy place to consecrate, yeah, 
to Romans, right? So, he, so this was the deliberately to defile the Jewish temple, right? We'll come back to that later. That is like a dress rehearsal. Those things Daniel say have to happen when Antichrist comes. And lots of people say, oh, it's already fulfilled then because that happened in AD 70. Not quite. We'll explain that soon. Dress rehearsal. But there's a more important one a couple of hundred years earlier. In fact, a couple of hundred years before Jesus. And that's the one we're going to focus on. So if you turn to page two, going to look at a bit of history. Now, this will probably bend your mind slightly because remember, we are... BC, so that as the number gets smaller, it means it's more recent. Okay, so in 198 BC, there is a Seleucid king. Now, the Seleucids, I think I mentioned to you the other day, who's heard of Alexander the Great? There was a movie with Brad Pitt, wasn't there? Alexander? So it's that guy. Who was it? Colin Firth, was it? Farrell. Anyway, there was a movie. And, you know, he was looking very handsome and conquering the world and all that stuff. So Alexander the Great was a ferocious warrior and he conquered most of the known world. At the time, his empire was the largest empire that had ever been. Okay? He conquered most of the known world, including uh, Judea. Now, when he died, he had a bunch of sons and... What happened was his kingdom was just divided up amongst the sons. So instead of just making one of them king, he rather unwisely decided that they could all be kings separately, neighbours. But, you know, when you're the sons of someone like that, you're usually not satisfied with small kingdoms. You want big ones. So they had a habit of being at war with each other fairly continually, <coughs> the brothers, right? And these guys were known as the Seleucid kings. So that's what that means, sons of Alexander the Great. And this particular guy, Antiochus III, or Antiochus the Great is his other name, he liked the gland that the Egyptians under Ptolemy the, the V, Pharaoh Ptolemy V, he had a big empire, and this guy decided he wanted to have it. And part of what Ptolemy owned was... Judea, Israel, if you like, Judea and Samaria. He started a long process to try and get his hands on this. Can anybody imagine how he might do it? What's the traditional way? Hmm? How do you normally get more land back in those days? You have a war. Okay. And he had a go at that. It wasn't particularly successful because the Egyptians back in those days, just like in the days of Pharaoh, the Egyptians were pretty mean. They were no easy target. Right? So this guy, he, he starts this whole ambition of that family to own this land. Doesn't do particularly well. But then along comes a son, Antiochus the fourth in 175 BC so that's 20 odd years later he becomes the new king then in 168 he ends up looting the temple at Jerusalem we're going to look at that in a minute he loots the temple in Jerusalem but and massacres heaps and heaps of Jews and he forbids the practice of the Jewish religion in their own land. Okay, not a nice guy. Then, in 167, he does the same thing as the Romans did in AD 70. He sets up uh, a statue of, this time it's of Zeus. Remember, this guy's Greek, not Roman. And I think I mentioned to you last time, just to make Zeus look even better, he had the statue modelled on himself. So Zeus ended up with the head and face of Antiochus somehow, you know. And he did pagan sacrifices and so on in the temple. But this guy here, Mattathias and his five sons, 
John, so his Hebrew name would be Yochanan, Shimon, Eliezer, uh, Yonatan, and Yehuda. They didn't like it. These guys, this family, were priests, Levites. So they were priests of the temple, and they weren't having it. So what do you think um, one man and his sons can do against a powerful king and his armies? You would think, just go home and complain and moan and, you know, get drunk or something. Oh no, they had a secret weapon. What's the secret weapon do you think they had? God. Okay, so lesson one, numbers don't matter. What matters is whose side God is on. So they start an uh, armed rebellion against Antiochus to kick him out and recapture the temple and recapture the land, right? 166, uh, Mattathias dies, that's the dad, and Yehuda takes the place as a leader, and he's the one who's most famous. He's known as uh, Yehuda Maccabee, Yehuda the, the Hammer. Why would you have a nickname as the Hammer? Because whatever he came up against got smashed. <laughs> you know, literally. He, cut a long story short, he actually succeeds. The Maccabees actually succeed in driving the Greeks out. They succeed in keeping the Egyptians out, and they succeed in keeping Israel, or Judah, Jewish, all the way until 63 BC when the Romans turn up. Okay. The reason the gospel is in Greek, by the way, is because of these Seleucid guys. Even though they succeeded that, Greek remained the most common language in the land. Even after Jesus, even after the Romans, Greek was like embedded as the common tongue. That's why your New Testament's in Greek. And we can, there's a few other things there. That you can go, oh, I just mentioned this one in 142 BC. They re-establish the Jewish Commonwealth, right? All the kings around, including the Seleucids, acknowledge the Jews as rulers of their own land. And they get so brave, they actually start taking back some territory that they would lost. And then they took some territory that they never had. So they actually got so bold that they invaded some of their neighbours, and they forced them to become Jewish. And the most important place historically for us in that is a place called Iodomia, which in the Old Testament is called Edom. Who's heard of Edom? The Edomites. Who do the Edomites descend from? Yeah. These guys are not Jewish by nature. They are closer to Ishmael. They're not Muslim. Islam didn't exist then. Remember, Islam only goes back to about the fifth century. Didn't exist before that. Okay, but so Edomites are more closely related to Ishmael, not Isaac. Right. So the Jews conquer them and force them to become Jewish. Right. When the Romans turn up, they're looking for someone that they can trust to not be that friendly with the Jews and yet could pass for a Jew. Who would you get? We get an either man, an Edomite, who is nominally Jewish because he's been forced to be, but actually he has no real loyalty to the 12 tribes because actually culturally he's not Jewish, he's not, right? And so that's who the Romans chose to rule for them. Can anyone think then of what the most famous Herod all the Herods, they're not Jewish. They're, they're Edomites. They're from Iodomia, this place that the Jews conquered. So they're nominally Jewish, but culturally they're not part of the 12 tribes. Which is why the Romans put them there, because they knew they could be trusted. Because the Jews hated them, because they were Edomites. <laughs> you know? Anyway. Why is that important for understanding the Antichrist? When he comes, Herod is another foretype of the Antichrist. 
he was acceptable to the Romans and kind of acceptable to the Jews. Antichrist will be like that. He'll be someone who can pass for many things. He'll be, uh, the Muslims will accept him, the Jews will accept him, the Buddhists will accept him, the fake Christians will accept him. Because he'll be like Herod, he'll be a bit of a wear many coats, you know, can pass for many things. But anyway, that's the history, right? But now we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail. In 175, when Antiochus IV turns up, he wasn't actually supposed to be king. It's supposed to be his brother. And if his brother died, it's supposed to be the sons of his brother. Did that stop Antiochus IV? No. You, I'd be amazed if you could remember. Remember we did the seven churches? What can you remember about the church at Pergamon? What does God say about Pergamon, the town? He says things about the church, but can you remember what he says about Pergamon, the place where the throne of Satan is on earth? Okay. Why is Pergamon important? Well, Antiochus, really, he was just a, a guy from a powerful family, but he had no real prospects because he's like the other son. So it's his brother who's going to be the king and then it'll go to his kids and so you'll be like the spare dinner. You know, you're like Harry. Have I got that around the right way? Who's going to be king? William, isn't it? Yeah. So you'll be like Harry. You're the member of the royal family, but really you're the decoration because it's the other guys, good, you know? Well, he wasn't having that. So he went to Pergamon, which in those days was a powerful kingdom. Using the help of the ruler of Pergamon, so spiritually that's Satan, right? He stages a coup and he basically bumps off his brother and his sons and becomes, and basically just forces his way in to become king back in his own land. So he steals the throne with the aid of Pergamon. This comes later in your writing, but we might as well say it now. This guy, he calls himself, his real name is Antiochus, right? But then he gives himself, oh, that's a P. He gives himself this title, Epiphanus. Is that an E? Might be, can't remember, I'm a terrible speller. This word, it's not his name, it's a title. And the, the important thing to understand is he gave this title to himself when he became king. His, his dad was called Antiochus the Great. So he thinks, oh, I need a, a title. So he calls himself Antiochus Epiphanes. This means, this word, Greek word, means God in person. So Antiochus takes the title of God in the same way that Pharaoh used to, you know? So when you get a man who claims to be God but isn't God, what do you call that? Antichrist. See how I mean by God doesn't hide these things. The, the rehearsals are pretty easy to spot if you know what you're looking for. So he gets his power from where? Pergamon. So it's the power that Pergamon represents. Satan empowers this guy to set himself up as this. Is it, are we talking about history or the future? That's Midrash, you see. This is history, but it points to future. Understand? So just a guy will suddenly claim to be this. Right. Now, in 168 BC, oh, shall I? No, I'll, I'll do it in this order. In 168 BC, he wants to get what would be most of what's modern day Syria today, which in those days really belonged to the Egyptians. So he sets out to take it, 
right? You have to know he's already got Judea at this stage. But he's not happy. Judea's not enough for him. He wants what we would call Syria today as well. And he starts a little war. And he, sh he would have won it. Except something he didn't count on happened. This new power that was rising wasn't big yet, but it was already a bit scary, and that was called Rome. So the Roman Empire didn't exist yet, but it was on the way to existing. It was already like you wouldn't mess with it. Syria was too close to Italy for comfort. So the Romans sent a general, just one guy. This was a deliberate message. We're not scared of you, we're not sending an army, we're just gonna send one guy. They sent one guy to Antiochus and, and he says, Rome says go home. And he says, well, you can't make me go home. Um, he says, yes, we can, you go home. You're not allowed this country, Syria. You leave the Egyptians alone. We don't approve, go home. And a famous thing happened. Antiochus said, well, you go away, I'll think about it. And the guy took a stick, and they're standing in the desert, right? Guy took a stick and he walked around Antiochus with the stick and drew a circle in the sand. And, and he says, you may not leave the circle without making a decision. Take as long as you like. In other words, stand in the desert a long time if you want to take a long time. But if you step outside of the circle without agreeing, it will be war. Well, Antiochus wasn't completely stupid. He was arrogant as hell, but he wasn't completely stupid. And he knew that he'd never survive a war with Rome. So he gave in. But have you ever met someone who's super vain? Super vain, super, you know, they think they're God. And they have to give in to somebody and not get their way. What are they like when they have to give in? You know, are they, do they give in gracefully? What are they like? They're a nightmare, aren't they? They're angry. They want to hit something. They want, you know, they usually want to break the furniture. They don't like losing, isn't it? That's Antiochus. And he's on his way back, having to withdraw out of Syria, and he gets news. And the news is that the Jews in Jerusalem have heard that he's lost this battle and have thought that, oh, here's history. So they've taken the opportunity to start a rebellion in Jerusalem to free themselves from Antiochus. He is furious because he didn't get what he went for. And because he missed out what he, on what he went for, he's insanely angry. And then he hears what these guys are doing. This is what brings the destruction in Jerusalem. He sends his army, turns his army around, and he sends them to Jerusalem, and thousands and thousands die. He just butchers people left and right. Jews. He doesn't care whether they're part of the rebellion or not. He, because he's just vain and angry and he's upset that the Romans won't let him do what he wants, so he just takes it out on these people, right? He deliberately decides to, to go further. He's decided you're not allowed to be Jewish anymore, you're going to be Greek. So he sets up the Greek God in the temple with his own face on it, because he thinks he is God. He thinks he is that God in person. And he does pagan sacrifices in the temple, defiling the temple, and he forbids anyone <coughs> To practice Judaism in, in Judah, never mind in the temple, not even in the land. So the Levites, lots of the Levites are killed, the priests are killed, you know, the temple sacked. What does this tell us about the future? Well, I'll show you that in a, two seconds. But first, you need to understand again what we read from Daniel 9. So maybe I'll just read this. 
Daniel 9. After the 62 sevens, the anointed one, what is Hebrew for the anointed one? Huh? Starts with M. Mas Hamashiach, Messiah. So Messiah just means anointed. So after 62 sevens, the anointed one, the Messiah, will be put to death and will have nothing. The people of the ruler will come and will destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And at the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. Everything Antiochus did, Daniel prophesied. You know he set up the idol. You know he caused an end to the sacrifice and offering. So did he do the first thing? In the middle of the seven, he breaks the agreement. I'm going to go slightly out of order now, but this is the best time to say it. How did, remember I said, normally you start a war if you want land in those days, isn't it? You know, you invade. Antiochus never invaded. There's never a war. How did Antiochus get to be ruler over the Jews? This is really important for, our, for the future of the church. How did he? Well, he conned his way in. Remember, we talked about the primary thing about the end times is deception. The Antichrist, like Satan, is a seducer. You know, he's like the ultimate second-hand car salesman. So what he did is he came to the ones he knew were fairly false anyway, the Sanhedrin, the same sort of people that Jesus had trouble with. So they were supposed to be the priests and all the rest of it, but actually they were really only concerned with like earthly things. They weren't really very connected to God, even though they were the, the priests and the rulers. And he said, you guys are still practicing what you've always been practicing for centuries. You're like in the Stone Age. You should let me bring all these modern things. And in those days, modern and Greek were like the same thing. Because, the, you know, the advanced culture in terms of science and technology and everything were the Greeks. So he comes along and says, hey, I can bring you all the benefits of Greek culture and give it to you. And so I'll build you, can you remember this? I'll build you a gymnasium. Remember what that means? The university, yeah. So the real meaning of the word gymnasium is where you exercise your mind. You know, then I'll build you, then I'll bring you the advantage of, of all the knowledge of the Greek empire. So I'll build you libraries and I'll teach you this and teach you that. Well, they think this is great. So what do they do? They basically cave in and invite him in to rule. They decide that it's beneficial to let him be in charge. What would that look like in the church now? Because it's happening right now. That process, what would it look like in the church right now? Not so much amen, but the same thing is going on right now. What should we be practicing as Christians? Anything new? No. God doesn't change. His commandments don't change. What's required to be a disciple doesn't change. The agenda doesn't change. The goal doesn't change. But what's happening in the church? Nothing but change. Why? Change for what? Well, the, the spirit of Antichrist is already doing to the church what Antiochus did to Judah. You need to be modern. You need to let these worldly ideas in so you'll be more, you know. Can anyone think of an example from recent times? Who's heard of seeker friendly? What should you really be preaching in your church? All, all the sinners, without repentance, you are going to hell. Not because God will judge you, because you stand condemned already. You know? That's the gospel, is that there is a way out of that 
pre-existing condition. What does the church preach? That? No? Why did it stop? Because using the popular ministries, they were told, ah, oh, if you want numbers, if you want a lot of people in the church, he'll pay more tithe, so you'll have more facilities, you'll have a bigger photocopier, you'll have, uh, you know, a bigger screen and a better kitchen and you'll be able to help more people. You know, it all sounds good, right? All you have to do is stop preaching that scary stuff and just preach, you know, hold hands, sing kumbaya and everything will be rosy. You know, have youth groups that have a lot of camps and a lot of concerts and a lot of, you know, pizzas and ice cream. So it's like a social club. I'm not joking, it's exactly what they said. So what did the church do? That sounds like it would work. And you know what? It did. So churches got bigger by numbers, but die spiritually because they actually stop being Christian. The gospel itself disappears. What spiritual agency is behind that boy can I help you message? It's exactly what Antiochus did with the, with the Sanhedrin. The spirit of Antichrist is getting the false church ready to receive Antichrist. When he appears, they, will, they won't be offended. They'll go, oh, you're here, come on in. Exactly like the Jews did then. Does that make sense? It's only the real Christians that sit there going, you're doing what? What? That's what the Maccabees were. They were just a tiny remnant who weren't sucked in, who were looking at this and going, you've got to be kidding me. Right? But the majority, they just saw all the worldly benefits of what Antiochus was offering. So they welcomed him in. But then in 168, it all goes horribly wrong. Because the guy they thought he was all going to be, he's their man. Next minute, he's killing everyone in sight. He's cancelling your religion. He's setting his God up in your church. So churches that are inviting the doctrines of like Rick Warren or Bill Johnson or whatever, this is what they're actually doing. They're inviting that to rule in God's house instead of God. You understand? That's why people like me get so annoyed about it, because of the consequences that means in the end for those who are in those places. Remember what I said, how he was denied what he wanted, so he was enraged, and so he turns and he vents his anger on the Jews. Is that telling you anything about the future? It is. Who'd like to, on page three, you see the box there, it starts Revelation 12, verse 13. Who wants to have a burst at that, Daryl? Yeah? When the dragon saw that he had been hurled to the earth, he pursued the woman, the body of Christ, the real church, who had given birth to the male child. The, wo the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle, so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the wilderness where she would be taken care of for a time, times and a half a time, cut off the serpent's reach. This is a picture of rapture. Thirty and a half years later, the bird returns with Jesus to see Satan again. So. Oh, <laughs> All right. Then from his mouth, the serpent spewed water like a river to overtake, to overtake the woman and swept her away with the torrent. But the earth helped the woman by opening its mouth and swallowing the rain <coughs> that the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to, to wage war against the rest of her offspring. Those who kept God's commands and hold fast their testimony about Jesus. What Revelation's pointing to is Antichrist, the dragon. There are two beasts, right? When Satan has two modes of operation. One is deception. One is the Hollywood version where it's, he's out to terrify you or hurt, right? 
So when the scripture talks about him in the mode of the liar, the deceiver, the seducer, it always refers to him as a serpent, like in the Garden of Eden, you know, the slippery snake. But when it talks about him, when he's given up on trying to deceive and he just basically takes his disguise off and he's just violence and persecution and he's described as the dragon. So it's the two aspects of his nature, same person, same, same uh, kingdom of Satan, just the two different aspects, serpent and the dragon. So here it's talking about the dragon pursuing <coughs> the woman from whom the child had come. This is talking about the real church, the, who, are, who are connected directly with Jesus, right? So when the Antichrist comes, the main thing he's after is us. The thing he wants to kill is us, right? Does he get to do it? What does Revelation 12 tell you? No, because God doesn't permit it. He causes that woman to fly away to beyond where the dragon can reach her. What else do you know about what happens at the end time that sounds like that? It's the rapture. So at the time where, remember how, from what Daniel said, that the first half, Satan deceives everybody, except the you know, but they think he's the nice guy. But then he breaks the covenant. Suddenly his real nature is revealed. So suddenly scripture starts talking about him as the dragon. So when he reveals his real agenda, he's after us. Right? What happens? God, bang, the rapture, we're gone. He, he, God takes us to where Satan can't reach us, heaven, into his presence, right? Remember Antiochus? when the Romans wouldn't let him have what he set out to get. Re Revelation 12 describes that exact same thing. It says that the dragon is enraged that he's been denied what he wanted by a power greater than himself. Just like Antiochus was denied by Rome, a power greater than himself, Antichrist will be livid with rage because he thinks he's going to have the Christians for breakfast and then God, who's much more powerful than him, they're out of his reach. He can't touch them. They're gone. So what does he do? He does the same thing Antiochus did. He turns on the rest of the family. Who are the last of God's family that are not raptured? It's the Jews. This starts what's known as the time of Jacob's trouble. And I know I've talked about that a lot, but it suddenly occurred to me, you probably have never, I've probably never stopped to point out where it is. So you will find it on page three in Jeremiah 30. These are the words the Lord spoke concerning Israel and Judah. This is what the Lord says. Cries of fear are heard, terror, not peace. Ask and see, can a man bear children? Then why do I see every strong man with his hands on his stomach like a woman in labour, every face turning deathly pale? How awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob. But what does it say next? But he will be saved out of it. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks and I will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David their king, who, what's he say? Whom I will raise up for them. Remember, this is Jeremiah prophesying. So who is the one that Jesus, God will raise up to reign on the throne of David? Jesus, right? But notice the pattern. Something so terrible, even strong men are like crying like little babies. And that there's no day like it. It's the worst, you know, the, it's the worst ever. And yet, it turns into their salvation. You see that pattern there? So it starts off that there's never been anything as bad as this. But the end result of that is salvation. 
and we'll see how this works again in a second. So Antichrist, like Antiochus did, will turn on the Jews and he will do, according to Daniel, just what Antiochus did. He will set his own God up in the temple at Jerusalem. He will set up the abomination that causes desolation in the temple at Jerusalem. Just as Antiochus did, just as the Romans did, rehearsal, rehearsal. Right? He will try and evict the real God from his own house and establish his God, who is who? Who's the Antichrist's God? Satan. Satan. Okay, so he will try and have Satan worship in the temple at Jerusalem. That's what he will do. When we read Zechariah 12, remember how I said Antiochus butchered thousands and thousands of people? Antichrist does much worse. Zechariah tells us that two thirds of all Jews on the earth will die two-thirds that's a lot but the one-third when they think they're going to die as well suddenly God pours his spirit on them and causes their blindness to go away he opens their eyes to see what they were missing and they realize that Jesus who they rejected is the Messiah then what you read in Romans 11 this is all talking about Jacob, right? Jacob, Jacob, Jacob. Who can tell me whenever it talks about Jacob, what does that mean? So, yeah, so God is talking about Israel backslidden. Because remember, Jacob is his old name. When he wrestles with God at Penuel, he says, I'm going to give you a new name. Your name will be Israel. He wrestled with God, right? So whenever God calls them Jacob, it's because they're behaving like they're, un, you know, like they used to. But suddenly it says there in Romans that all Israel will be saved. Not Jacob, Israel. So it's talking that the one third who repent, they are the ones that you would have read about in Zechariah, that they will look upon the one they have pierced and weep as one weeps for an only son. Why do you weep for an only son? Because if your only son dies, your name goes extinct. Right? So it's special weeping if you've only got one person carrying your family name and then they die. It's like your family name becomes extinct. That's the meaning of that. So as they will weep as one weeps for an only son, right? But when they cry out to him, when they cry out for mercy and they're actually genuinely repentant, what happens? What happens when anyone repents? Jesus comes. For you and me, it's by the Holy Spirit. But when it's, the, when it's not a rehearsal anymore, when it's the final real thing, it's really the time where Jeremiah 30 is actually being fulfilled and the enemy is the actual, the Antichrist, not an Antichrist like Antiochus. So when it's no longer dress rehearsal, it's the main, main act. When they call on him, that third, that's what brings the second coming. Because he doesn't just send the Holy Spirit, he comes himself. He comes to save them. Who else comes with him? Us. Remember how he took the rest away and hid them? With himself. So he comes and so does the church with him. It says that the skies will split open and the whole earth will see it. Wherever you are on the earth, you will know. No, you will not be able to avoid the fact that the heavens have split open because this time he doesn't sneak in as a baby in a manger. This time he comes back as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in glory and might and fury and rage to avenge his name against Antichrist and his kingdom, right? How long does the battle last? Like, do we need to get fit for the battle? How much fighting are we going to do? I know people are looking forward to it. Oh, I can't wait to be, oh, I'm going to punch Satan in the face. Are you now? 
You know? How much fighting will the Christians do? None. Because the scripture says that Satan, Antichrist and his army are defeated instantly by the brilliance of his appearing and by the breath of his mouth. So Jesus turning up instantly defeats Satan and the Antichrist and everything that's following him will just melt. It's not even a battle. It's not even a proper battle. And just so you know, when Jesus turns up, Antichrist and his army have Jerusalem surrounded. That's where the final third are that are crying out. They're trapped inside Jerusalem, completely surrounded. The army's so vast, they can't all stand in Jerusalem. The army's so vast, most of it is waiting in the valley of Jezreel under a mountain called Har Megiddo. How do you say Har Megiddo in English? Armageddon. So when you hear reference to Armageddon, that is where the army of Antichrist is gathered to assault Jerusalem and kill the last of the Jews. That's where Antichrist's army has assembled itself. It's not far from Jerusalem, it's really close. Okay? So Jesus appears and basically vaporizes them. The battle is over simply by his turning up. Boom, finish, over. And then he comes into the city and the millennial kingdom begins. Right? So, turning over. Jesus talks about these things as well. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel. So that's what we just read in Daniel 9. Let the reader understand and let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. So he's repeating what Daniel said, right? Lots of people try and say this has already happened. Remember I'm always moaning about Dominionists? Remember Dominionists, the kingdom now? People say the kingdom's already here. If the kingdom was already here, then this has to have already happened, right? And they say, yeah, but it did in AD 70. Remember I was saying the Romans did what Antiochus did? They set up the, an abomination. They sacrificed the pig on the altar, blah, blah, blah. They did all these things, right? They say all this has been fulfilled. And, it, you know, it's a terrible day and millions were killed. What tells you that that is not the fulfillment and it's just a rehearsal? It's a real rehearsal, but it's not the actual thing. What tells you? What Daniel and Jesus both say. There will never be a day to equal it for distress. Right? So when Antiochus comes... Something like about 500,000 Jews are killed by him. In AD 70 and AD 136, when the Roman legions turn up, they kill just a bit less than 2 million Jews are killed. Right? That's a lot of people. That's a quarter of New Zealand. Right? Where am I going with this? So if, if this is the fulfillment, it has to be a day of, e of evil and distress for the Jews with no equal. So that's AD 70, right? What if I was to mention AD 1938 to 1945? How many Jews are killed by Antichrist then? In the concentration camps, six million, right? By Stalin and the Soviet Union, an estimated further four million. 
because Hitler wasn't the only one killing them. And then an unknown number killed, killed in their own villages by the Einsatzgruppe of the, of the Waffen SS in Russia in the millions, never recorded numbers, right? By every best estimation, remember how I said two thirds will die at the end? Remember we talked about rehearsal? Two thirds of the entire European Jewish population died, were murdered. So we're talking like 10 million probably. How does that compare to two? Even if you ignore the ones in Russia, six to two. You know straight away that what happened in AD 70 cannot be the fulfillment of what Daniel and Jesus are talking about. It's a rehearsal. You understand? What happened to the one third that didn't die? Most of them ended up in Israel. They left Europe and became the initial population of the new state of Israel. Some countries in Europe have virtually no Jews in them anymore. Places like Poland, where the Jewish population was virtually exterminated completely. Right? So if you run into Dominionists, and you will, remember this. When they try and tell you that the things Jesus was talking about, the things Daniel was talking about, oh, that's already been fulfilled. No. And remember, when it is fulfilled, it has to be worse than this. So imagine how bad, you know. There's only 10 million Jews in, in Israel and about the same in the US and probably a lesser number left in Europe and quite a lot in Africa. Most of Ethiopia are Jewish. You know? So two thirds of them have to, be, have to die when Antichrist does his thing. Not a happy time. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. Future event. These are just dress rehearsals. Get the idea of the scale of how terrible it will be. Just as well then that the church is gone by then. You don't want to be around. You certainly don't want to be a non-Christian because if you're a non-Christian, you're still here. You're still part of it. You're not quite as targeted, but you're still experiencing those things. Let's flip over the rest of four because you can read that at home. Now, remember, can I rub this out? Remember, you have the books that are we count as scripture, but then there are other books that are just Jewish history. So they don't, they, it's not thus says the Lord, it's just Jewish history, the things that the Jews keep and treat as for learning, but it's just what their historians wrote down. And there's two books that tell us what happened in these times. First Maccabees and second Maccabees. And I'm, you can correct me on this, but I think if you look in a Catholic Bible, they are in there. Right? So, um, so the two and Enoch, isn't it? The book of Enoch? So Enoch and the first Maccabees and second Maccabees are not considered to be scripture, they're Jewish history. So they're useful, so they, they are useful reference, but they don't carry the same weight as thus says the Lord, the scripture. But they are it's called apocryphal. So they are like complementary books that fill in stuff from Jewish history that you wouldn't otherwise know. Now in it, in 2 Maccabees, it describes what happens to Antiochus. And in 164, while vainly trying to regain his lost power because the Maccabees had defeated him, um, the all-seeing God, the God of Israel, struck him with an incurable and invisible blow. As soon as he stopped speaking, he was seized with a pain in his bowels for which there was no relief and with sharp internal tortures. And that very justly, for he had tortured the bowels of others and with many and strange afflictions. Yet 
He did not in any way stop his insolence, but he was even more filled with arrogance, breathing fire in his rage against the Jews and giving orders to drive even faster. And so it came about that he fell out of his chariot as he was rushing along and the fall was so hard as to torture every limb of his body. Thus he was only a little while before thinking he was uh, in his superhuman arrogance that he could command the waves of the sea and had imagined that he could weigh the high mountains in a balance was instead brought down to the earth and carried away on a stretcher, making the power of God manifest to all. Secular history agrees with that. So that's Jewish history, Book of Maccabees, ordinary history, Roman history, and that agrees with that. So nobody dealt with Antiochus. God dealt with him himself. He just inf afflicted him with a excruciating disease and he died. Okay? And everyone got the message that he who called himself God, remember Epiphanus means God in person, that the fake God couldn't deal with a bunch of priests. The Maccabees, a bunch of priests, and not even soldiers, were able to defeat him in battle and drive Antiochus and his army out of Judea. How is that possible? The same way that God went ahead of Joshua and the, the tribes when they entered the land. Remember, it's God himself that defeated their enemies. He went ahead of them. He did the winning of the battle. Right? And then he himself dealt with Antiochus. What does that tell us about the future? Unlike what the kingdom now people say, it's not the church that will defeat Satan. The church doesn't stand a prayer of defeating Satan. That is a joke. Never underestimate how powerful Satan is. He's not to be played with. So God himself will destroy Antichrist. God himself will bring judgment on Antichrist, on Satan and on his kingdom. We're just along for the ride. Does that make sense? Why is that important? Because it's... If, you're in a, if you get near those Pentecostal guys, they'll try and convince you that it's up to us to send Satan running away over the hill. No, no, no. It's up to us to be Christian and to teach the truth. Because Satan will be here and he'll get stronger and stronger and his son, Antichrist, will appear and all these things will happen. Why? Because God said they must. But don't worry. What seems like disaster, now we're coming to Hanukkah. What seems like disaster, because up to now, aren't you thinking, this doesn't sound very joyful. You know, what seems like there can't be even a way out. What can we do? You know, we're just the Maccabee family. There's just a few of us priests. We don't, we don't even know how to hold a sword. We're priests. How can we deal with this thing? And then God, God says, wait, it's my house that's been invaded. It's my name that's been slandered. It's my covenant that's been trampled. Therefore, I will deal with this. He does the battling. He does the winning. He does the saving. Right? Now we jump forward. to 166 BC and we see that um, Judah, the son, Judah, the, Judah um, Yehuda Maccabee, the hammer, he becomes the leader and the Jewish kingdom begins. And in 165, so a year later, there's a, a huge revolt and finally they are successful in recapturing Jerusalem and more particularly they recapture the temple, right? So Antiochus loses Jerusalem, his army has to run, and at last, the Maccabees and their followers have recaptured the holy city and recaptured the temple with a massive fight. Lots of dead people everywhere, including in the temple. But the temple's supposed to be holy, isn't it? 
you know so it's like desecrates the temple that not only what's the battle in there but also what Antiochus has been doing in there and remember the Maccabees are priests right what's the first thing if you're a, a priest and you finally recaptured the temple from God's enemies what's the first thing you want to do just put it into simple terms imagine some bunch of young druggies started squatting in your mother's house you know and the whole house is full of hypodermic syringes and empty beer bottles and all the rest of it and you're finally able to go in there and kick a few heads in and throw them out and you've got the house back what's the first thing you're going to want to do in your mother's house clean it restore it back to your being your mother's house instead of you know their place right so what do we call that in Christian terms? Re-sanctify the place. Remember, it's a building, but it has been, become like ritually unclean because of everything that's gone on in it, everything Antiochus has done in it. It's the whole place is defiled, right? So they set about doing everything you had to do to re-consecrate the temple. They had to wash it, they had to clean it, get rid of all the dead bodies out of it, and so on, and put all the broken things back right and then something incredibly important happens the last step is to relight the big candlestick called a menorah who's heard of a menorah remember we put a picture up of it a few weeks back yeah right so how many ca how many lamps are on it seven <laughs> Okay, this is the big one, and remember it's massively high. It's huge. It weighs like a ton of gold or something. You know? No, it's more than that. Yeah, it's, it's massive, right? And it's got these 12, oh, sorry, seven lamps, and it's supposed, those lamps are supposed to burn day and night in the temple, right? What does the light represent? His word, the means by which you can see in the dark. So why did God command that the that they burn the have it lit in the temple day and night? What is He wanting them to be conscious of? It, it represents His presence. He is the light. So it represents His presence. So the last thing the Maccabees wanted to do when everything else is ready, so when they wanted to declare His house holy again, set apart to the one God instead of the many gods of the Greeks. Right. What do you think the last and most important thing they would do? Relight the great menorah in the temple, right? But there's a problem. The whole place has been trashed. This thing runs on olive oil, special olive oil, absolutely pure, that's been gone through a ritual process that takes time, right? And only that special oil can be burned in the menorah. They search the temple up and down and they find a single jar of oil. <coughs> Enough to burn for one day. Right? They don't know what to do. But under the inspiration of God, they take the oil, they fill the seven lamps and they light them and what happens is the lamp doesn't go out at the end of the first day. The second day it doesn't go out. The third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth day it burns. All seven lamps continue to burn on the oil for a single day. Bonafide miracle, right? The Maccabees, who are Levi Levite priests, remember, they are deeply conscious that this is God. By the ninth day, they've, meanwhile, they've been rushing to prepare oil because it was a normal thing in the temple to always have oil being prepared to keep the lamp going, right? By the ninth day, they have new oil to continue. But God caused it to miraculously burn for eight days when there should have only been one day's worth of oil. So 
If you go to Leviticus or Deuteronomy that sets out our calendar, you know, of your holy days, you will not find Hanukkah there. Okay? It's not one of the appointed feasts. But why, do, why should we acknowledge it then? Well, have a look at the bottom of page 5. John chapter 10. This is the same chapter where John, oh, sorry, John, where Jesus reveals himself as the shepherd that Ezekiel said would come to rescue the lean sheep. Remember, I am the good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice. They will not follow another. So this is that same chapter, right? Then it says, Then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. And Jesus was in the temple courts. Okay, you can read the rest for yourself. The Feast of Dedication. So all you Hebrew speakers, tell me what the Hebrew word for dedication might be. Oh, yeah. Hanukkah is Hebrew for dedication. And the meaning of dedication is the same way like when you like a the dedication of a baby or like a christening, you know? So it's consecrating, to set aside as holy, to dedicate or rededicate the place to God. Hanukkah. Why should we take notice? Because Jesus did. Jesus observed Hanukkah. If it's good enough for Jesus to observe Hanukkah, it's good enough for us, right? But here we are about 167 BC, and the Maccabees realize that this is such a significant miracle that not only has God allowed them to kick Antiochus and his armies out, he's also done this miracle with the menorah. So they swear an oath, and they have the people swear an oath, that ever after, on that day, on that calendar day that they lit, relit the lamp, they would forever after remember the eight days that God caused the light to burn, and that there would be no fasting or mourning, but the whole of the people would rejoice and concentrate on the fact that God was able to deliver them from Antiochus, who, remember, is a prototype of the Antichrist. So what do you get? You turn over to page six. Almost done. What you get... is on the 25th day of Kislev, which for that, for us this year, that's the 3rd of December. Then for eight days, which ends on the third day of the month of Tevet. For us, that's the 10th of December. This is a 29 day month. So that month is almost over when it starts. So this, is, this one's fixed by calendar day because it's remembering the calendar day that it happened. So for eight days, they will, every Jew and every Jewish household, they, every day, they will light the candles of, of the menorah for eight days and they will dance and sing and give thanks to God and feast. So there's no mourning or fasting or anything like that. This is like... Celebration, celebration, remembering what? That God enabled his house, his remnant, those who were faithful to him, to not only just survive, but to see him throw Antichrist out and to re-establish his rule in his own house. What, that's in the past, that's 167 BC. What's that telling us about tomorrow? Well, to help you understand, uh, and uh, you'll see there on page six, uh, the uh, alternate name for Hanukkah is the Feast of or Festival of Lights. 
Because what they used to do when the temple still stood there, they would light masses of lamps. So at night, the top of Temple Mount was like a lighthouse, you know? So for eight days, Jerusalem would be just, especially at night, would just be like there was some giant lighthouse on the top of the mountain, the light pouring out of the temple, right? So that's why it's sometimes known as the Festival of Lights. It's all joyous, amazing. Lots of other writers, Josephus, the Roman historian that wrote about it as being like no other festival he'd ever seen for like extravagance and joy, you know? To understand a bit, you might ask yourself, why eight days? Why did God cause it to burn for eight days? So break it down. Remember, numbers mean something usually when God is sending a message. Is this God sending a message? Yeah. Not only have I was able to rescue you from that clown, but look, I can keep this lamp going when you can't. Why? Because what does the light represent? Him. So what's he saying? I am, re I am the real light. Me keeping the light going tells you that I'm really here. Because remember, the whole thing is about reconsecrating the house. What's the message God was giving him? I'm back. You know, my house was defiled. Everything was terrible. Blackest day. Lots of people dead. Bad news, bad news, bad news. Right? But now rejoice. Why? I'm back. There's a clue. What's this pointing to? When he's back. Why are they rejoicing? Why should we rejoice? What's the rejoicing thing for us? The message that even though the end times will be dreadful. Actually, it's good to have a Filipino audience because other than Arnie, who said, I'll be back. Who's the other dude? MacArthur, I shall return. But they're both imitating who? Jesus. You know, remember when he ascended into heaven and they were sad that he'd gone, but then there was an angel there. Remember what the angel says to them? What, why are you weeping? In the same way that he left, he will return. You know? So Arnie and MacArthur were both just imitating, they're just stealing Jesus' line in a sense. What Hanukkah teaches us, the reason it's supposed to strengthen us, is that, yeah, all the stuff we've been learning, even what we were learning in the first part of this about what has to happen, what Antichrist will do, sneaky, how he'll sneak his way in, then betray everyone, all that stuff, it's all fairly depressing if that was the whole story. You know, if that was the whole of the story, but it's only the half of the story. The rest of the story is that God says, I'll be back. And when I come back, that guy, he's gone. My people will, will be safe. My house will be rededicated. Now, why eight days? Have you seen eight appear anywhere else in the scripture? Not really. What would be the more common number you'd expect when God's talking about something that he's doing? Seven. seven. Right. So for the first seven days, if it burnt seven days, what might you, what inference might you draw from that? Remember the light is about, in, is representing his presence in his house among his people. So if it just went for seven days, what might you draw from that if you were explaining to someone? What does seven usually represent? Completion. completion or total. Okay, let's call it completion. And guess what? It does. So what is eight? Eight is completion plus one. Eight is Sorry? Eight is coming. Yeah, no, yeah. Seven, the first seven days, actually is about exactly what you should have all guessed. That I am God for the whole of your history. 
I will never leave my house. I will not forsake my people. I will not break my covenant. I will not, you know? So for the whole of human history, that's not just back, but forward, for all of the number of man's days, throughout your generations, I am God, right? Because I am the light of the world for the whole seven of the week. Why have I said, until everything is complete, plus one? What is the plus one? Well, have a look at the bottom of... Yeah, Brian's got it. But to see it specifically, see that box at the bottom of page six? Right at the bottom, you'll see Revelation 22. Okay? Revelation 22 is where John has been shown what the new kingdom, what the new heaven and the new earth will be like. Just in case anyone missed it, is this the permanent place? What is this? This is like the book of Exodus. This is the wilderness. This is just what you're passing through on the way, right? When Jesus returns, is it, is it heaven yet? No, what is it? It's the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. Do you understand? For a thousand years, why? Because God has promises he made to the patriarchs, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that he still has to keep, you know? about them having the land and the king on the throne and all that. So for a thousand years, Jesus will fulfill that literally on earth, on this earth. So the history of man goes on for another thousand years after Jesus returns. That's the millennial kingdom. And then Revelation tells us that after that, Satan, who's been chained up, is let out again. Why is he let out? Only to be destroyed. So God's had him chained up in the abyss along with all his demons. So for that whole thousand years, there, are, there is no demonic presence on earth at all, right? The millennial kingdom. Then it says that God lets him out. Why? Just so he can destroy him. It's at the end of the thousand years that the judgment happens, right? So people going to heaven or hell, is it? that actual judgment happens at the end of the thousand years. So this seven is the whole of mankind's history. Jesus comes back plus a thousand years and then end. This thing we're standing on has no further purpose in God's plan. Right? So God gets rid of this. Then it's the judgment then we have what Revelation 22 is here, and it's part of the description of what John has shown what will replace this. Right? Look what it says. No longer will there be any curse, no sin. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, that's the new Jerusalem, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Now look what it says in verse 5. There will be no more night. If there's no more night, how many more days will there be? It's a trick question. What is night? Remember, it's Jewish clock. So this is gone, and now the first day, the first day, you're in the new kingdom. But there's no night. Remember, it's a Jewish clock. When do the Jews reckon the clock clicks to tomorrow? When the sun goes down. Lunar, lunar calendar, remember? So if there's no sunset because there's no night, when does the first day end? Never. If the first day never ends, how much more time is there? All of this, the seven, plus one. The eighth day is God saying, I am God. And I am still God in the kingdom to come that will never end. I am the, I am 
the light for you forever, for the whole seven and for the day that follows, the day that doesn't have an end. Does that make sense? That's why eight. And if he is God who can kick Antiochus out, make the, make the lamp burn for eight days and all those other things, saying, I'm back, pointing to, you know, the most important I'll be back that we can think of. What's God saying to us? Why is, it, why is Hanukkah about joy, joy, joy? The, the message of Hanukkah is this. Yes, all the lead up is horrible. All the lead up is scary. All the lead up is violence and, you know. But mostly and almost exclusively for those who hate me and reject me. And when the time comes that Antiochus will try and have you, or more particularly the Antichrist that he represents, he won't get you. Why? Because a power greater than him will deny you to him. The rapture. And then at the proper time when he's finished dealing with the Jews to save the third, some people might say to you, if you're... You ask yourself this question, has God been unkind killing two-thirds and saving a third? Why can you say he's not been unkind? Because if they are Jewish people who had accepted Messiah, they would have been raptured already. So who is it that's left? These are the bad boys. These are the stubborn, arrogant, hard-headed, Jesus-hating Jews. Why should Jesus give a toss about them? Well, because he's Jesus, that's why. So even them, even them, he wants to save. So the third that gets saved is a third that wouldn't otherwise be saved, left to themselves. It's just to get them to repentance, it takes the time of Jacob's trouble to break their pride and their arrogance. Do you understand? So God is giving himself an extra last harvest that are in the seemingly no way you'll ever get them category. So the fact he gets a third is miraculous. Does that make sense? Get any idea? So Hanukkah, never mind Santa, Hanukkah at this time of year is the joyous thing for us. Now, I think that's all, the rest you can read, yeah, that's Oh, wait. What's here? Okay. That's all you need to... If you just read through this, that'll fill in any blanks. It's very important for your mental health and your spiritual health to have a Hanukkah point of view. That we can't... Remember, we keep saying you can't stop the bad stuff happening. It has to happen. Jesus says, when you see these things happening, look up. Your salvation is drawing near. What's he saying? Don't focus on the what bad stuff. You can't do anything about it. Look at me, he's saying. That's, it's the same with Hanukkah. That's his message. Don't be put off by when you see all this happening because I've done the rehearsals for you. You know, Hanukkah as an annual reminder of the most important rehearsal. I've shown you how it's going to end. You don't have to wonder. Will Antichrist be defeated? Absolutely. Will Jesus come back and boot him out? Absolutely. Will God's house be rededicated by him re-entering it? Absolutely. Will there be an eighth day? Absolutely. Why? Because he's the one that makes the light burn for the eight days, not us. Because it's down to him, not down to me, you can be certain it will be. Do you understand how important that is for us who may have to go through the trials to know that I know how this story ends. I know we have to have this crappy beginning, you know? But I know how it ends. No matter what Satan tries to claim, 
I know how it's actually going to end. Why? Because God's done the rehearsal for me to show me how it ends. So we can be ha rejoice even in the midst of that trial, because it's like we've snuck a, it's like we've snuck a, a look at the last page of the script. We already know how the movie's going to finish. You know, if you're his, that's only if you're his. Okay. So one last thing, and this is so that's what you need to know. And then just the one last thing, it's just a practical thing in case anyone ever asks you. Because the Jews don't have the temple, right? Hanukkah is supposed to happen at the temple, but they don't have a temple, do they? Right? So what they do is in the synagogue or even in the family home, every day of the eight days, they light another lamp. But there's a problem. The menorah, the seven things, the rabbis, centuries and centuries ago, decided that this is a holy and consecrated thing God commanded to be made for the temple at Jerusalem. It's too holy for anyone to use outside of the temple. So under rabbinic law, not God's law, rabbinic law, you are not allowed, a Jew is not allowed to use a menorah at home. You know? Because it's only for the temple. How do you get around it? Add some more. <laughs> Add some more. So you get this thing called a, a Hanukkah. Getting its name from Hanukkah. And it has one tall one in the middle. Lamp. Sometimes it's just a candle holder. So instead of oil lamps, they'll put candles. Tall one. And then, for the eight days, four in each. How many is that? Nine. So it's not a menorah. So I can have it at home. <laughs> okay? And what they do is they say, this represents God, the source of the light. So they light this on the first day. Then they take this one and they light this on the first day. Then they take this one and they light this on the second day, and by the eighth day, all eight are burning. But they receive, each one received its light from this one to remind themselves what the source of the light is, right? Which is a <laughs> typical rabbi way of getting around their own rules. Okay, so if anyone asks you how come some Jewish candlesticks are nine and some are seven, because it depends how seriously you take the rabbinic law. Lots of Jewish households have menorahs, but ultra-Orthodox Jews won't. They'll only have this one, and they'll only use it on Hanukkah. So that's just a little bit of, you know, trivial pursuits knowledge for you. You can get an extra point as to why some nine and some seven. So um, this will, of course, started happening on the 3rd and be going on today and then for the next couple of days in the synagogue in town, they will be progressively lighting <coughs> the extra candles until all eight are going. Okay. Hanukkah in the park tomorrow, if you're interested. I think it starts at about 10, goes to about 3. It's in the dell at, behind the, uh, the Begonia House in the Botanic Gardens. So there'll be Jewish food and Faith might dance again if they're lucky. <laughs> you know, so if you're not doing anything tomorrow, that's on in town if you want to go and try out some Jewish food or anything like that. But otherwise, at this time of year, this is where our minds should be. It was good enough for Jesus to go up to the Feast of Dedication, then it's good enough for us. And especially as the time approaches, where what the dress rehearsals were about may well, you know I mean, this might just be another dress rehearsal, but it might be it. Either way, we should behave as if it is it, because God's watching to see who are his and who are not. And as we finish here, 
engrave it on your head. I know how it ends. That's the message of Hanukkah. How it ends is my God saves his people himself by coming back to get them. So it's not up to me. It's up to me to be his. That's all it's up to me is to be really his disciple. The rest of it, he does. I know how the story ends. I don't have to worry about who's going to win this. Does make sense? Therefore, I'm entitled to have joy even in the middle of the lead up, which is a bit crappy. Does that make sense? That is the end of the lesson. Hopefully we won't be like a certain guy I read about who was captured by the Turks in the Crusades. He was a priest. And they, and they tied him on a steel shaft over a fire, like you, when you're roasting a pig. And they stuck him for like half an hour over the fire until all the skin was coming off. And they said, well, t you know, we'll take you down if you give up Jesus and accept Allah. And um, he just wouldn't do it. And finally, after half an hour, they said, isn't there anything you want to say to us? And he said to them, um, why don't you turn me over because I'm overdone on one side and not done at all on the other. <laughs> Whereupon they killed him as an act of mercy because they realised he was never going to crack. How could you do that? Because someone like that knows how it ends. The reason they're not afraid because the only thing to be afraid of is to be found not on the right team. You know? Does that make sense? So next week, hosted. So, you know, let's have some, you know, work out the format that you want. But let's basically just have some more singing. More than, you know, we won't have a sermon. You make it as long or as short as you like and pot luck so bring whatever you like that you think you don't get a choice yours <laughs> yours is ube ice cream <laughs> yeah yeah but daryl can he he can choose but not you um, fate has determined ube ice cream okay Okay, so that's next week, and then that'll be us. Um, we don't get this place back until the 19th of January. So that will be the, the last of the arc for this year, to next week. And then uh, it's only whatever we do at Christmas, which we should invite, um, you know, Thelma and everyone are going to do that to Christmas. I don't know, maybe they're doing something already, but... We'll invite, yeah, we'll invite the, everyone that's normally here. We'll invite them for Christmas Day because, you know, Filipinos need to eat. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Okay, let's pray. Who'd like to, Grace, I can see you're contemplating praying, so... <laughs> Amen. Amen. Okay, see you next week. Have a good time. Looking forward to Ube ice cream and other things. <laughs>